Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is good. And all the time. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to listen to the words of God. The words of God are the words of life. The words of God are the words of restoration. The words of God are the words of victory. And the words of God are the words of resurrection, whether physical or spiritual. So I thank you for coming, and I thank those online who are with us wherever you are. Thank you very much, and may God abundantly bless you. I recognize those of you online who are not Seventh-day Adventists. Thank you for joining us, and may God grant you a special blessing. Is there anyone in this building you are not a Seventh-day Adventist? We have not yet seen you. May I see your hand? You're not first time. You're here. First time. You're not. Ah, how very nice. Tell us your names, please. Let's begin at the left. My dear sister, what's your name? Say that again. Oh, Elaine, how are you, Sister Elaine? Nice to have you. God bless you. Right next to Elaine, what's your name? Who? Alina? Anila. How are you, Anila? Are you connected to my dear sister? Ah, all right. To the left. Khalil. How are you, Khalil? Good to see you. And next to Khalil, Shepherd. Good to have you, Mr. Shepherd. Say amen for our guest. Say it again. <clears throat> One more time. Amen. God is good. All and all the time. And behind this pillar, hiding so beautifully, is another guest. What's your name? Who? Samoy. How do you spell that? How are you, Samoy? Fine, thanks for asking. Nice to have you. Say amen for Samoy. Nice name. I never heard it before. God is good and all the time. Yes. Um, I am fine, since you asked, and I thank God for that. I have a question to answer. Let me pray first. Father in heaven, give me wisdom, give me insight, give me knowledge immediately, dear God, that I may represent you aright in answering this question. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The question is very simple and very powerful question. How can we study the Bible and retain <clears throat> what we study? There are several ways to study the Bible. One way is to study the lives of people in the Bible. You may choose Joseph, a young man of integrity. You know the story, Genesis 39 who would not disgrace God by getting involved with a woman who tried to seduce him. You may study the life of Daniel. You may study the life of Ruth. You choose an individual and study that person's life. Because life is life is life, Old Testament or New Testament. All people have trials and tribulations and tests. Or you may choose a book and study it until you know it better than anyone else on the face of the earth. You may take a little book, like 3rd John, 13 chapters, or 14, 14 verses, I should say, or 2nd John, or Philemon, some small book, or you may choose a little bigger one, two chapters, uh, Haggai, or four chapters, Malachi, and study that book. Who wrote it? To whom? Why? 
What were the circumstances? What were the lessons they had to learn from God? And how do those lessons apply to your life? Or you may choose a word, righteousness, and trace that word from Genesis to Revelation. Are you with me? It may be grace, which is first mentioned in Genesis 6, verse 8, or righteousness in a Genesis 7, I believe, of verse 1, when God declared uh, Noah to be righteous. So those are various ways to uh, study the Bible. There's another way that I learned from a friend of mine, very simple, very personal. You take a verse. You have to be fast. It's already five minutes to eight. Let's say you take the verse, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Where is that found? Philippians 4.13. You read the verse several times, and I mean several times. And then you ask, what is the verse saying? Then you ask, what is the verse saying to me? That's personalizing Bible study. You may ask, is the verse revealing a sin in my life? And if the answer is yes, what should you do? Come on, if the verse is yes, what should you do? Repent. Mm -hmm. Or you may ask, is the verse revealing a duty that I need to perform? If the answer is yes, then you begin performing that duty. Number five, does this verse help me to understand the character of God? Or, does this verse help me to understand another verse? For instance, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. You may say, now who is the Word who was with God? Verse 14, and the Word became flesh. So verse 14 helps you to understand that the word in verse 1 refers to Jesus Christ. So you ask, does this verse help me to understand another verse? And finally, you may say, how can I use this verse to encourage someone going through a trial? That's one way, simple way, very personal way to study the Bible. To retain it, obey it. Mm -hmm. To retain it, obey it. And if you learn a verse, say it over and over in the shower say it. you're brushing your teeth say it. you're washing your face say it you're in your car driving 20 miles to work say it over until you know it the way you know your own name all right god is good and all the time yes he is do you love god say yes mm -hmm. let me turn this thing off And if you have one of these things, which can be a nuisance sometimes, make sure it's turned off if you're not using it. If you are using it, just turn the sound down because we are in the presence of God. Am I right? Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I've told you before, my words cannot change your lives, but the words of God will change you. Before Paul became a preacher for Christ, he killed people. He did not kill them physically, but he arranged for them to be killed in the eyes of God. He was a murderer. That's what he did. The Apostle Paul killed Christians. But he met Christ. And Christ changed him from a killer to someone who gave his life for the gospel. Matthew was a tax collector. They were all thieves, virtually all thieves. He met Christ. And Christ changed him from a dishonest IRS agent. <laughs> into the man who wrote the first gospel of the bible are you with me listen to me this can change your life this can change a disobedient child into a behave into a, uh, a obedient child yes it can this can bring back your relative to christ this can change the attitude of your supervisor mm -hmm. this word so i want to speak god's words Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. That's what I want to speak. And favor number 3, what's that? Think. Isaiah 1 18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the time is flying quickly. Use me as efficiently as you will in the time that's allotted to me. Forgive me if I've sinned against you. Forgive us all, Father. We thank you for this honor of assembling in your presence, in this building and online. 
Father, grant us your spirit that he may open our eyes and our mind to learn the simple truth. Bless everyone listening. A special blessing on all our guests. We're delighted to have them in this building and online. Father, bless this nation of the United States, the host nation of these meetings. But Father, there are people listening all over the world. Bless their nations too, I pray. Surround them with your angels. Fill them with your spirit. Provide their needs. Heal their diseases, dear God. But above all, draw them into your bosom. Now, Father, speak through me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me to Luke chapter 22. We'll read from verse 41. Our subject, what's chasing you? What did I say? What's chasing you? You know, some people run when nobody's chasing them. A guilty conscience will cause you to do that. You're running and there's no one chasing you. Luke chapter 22, we'll read from verse 41. When you found that, say amen. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, doing what? Strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed the more earnestly, and his blood was as it were, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Christ was suffering. It was so bad, he asked the Father, get him out of it. He began to sweat blood. And he prayed this prayer. Now, go to Matthew 26. Let's read verse 44. Matthew 26, verse 44. Matthew wrote primarily to a Jewish audience. Luke wrote primarily to a Gentile audience. Luke himself was a Gentile. Luke is the only non-Jewish Bible writer. All other Bible writers were Jews or Israelites. Luke was the only non-Jewish Bible writer. But we're in Matthew 26, verse 44. Read with me. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time saying the same words which were father if thou be willing remove he prayed and he prayed why because christ was suffering now why do i begin the message with that this is what will happen to those who reject christ plus what happened on the cross that suffering that Jesus experienced for us. Those who reject him, this is what is in store for them. Now the Bible is a book of blessings. It's also a book of curses. Because obedience brings blessing. Finish my words. Disobedience brings curses. And it's irresponsible of a preacher only to give the bright side and not give the unpleasant side. When you go to school, you're told you need 70 points to pass. To pass. 69 you fail simple as that you know the the, the landmarks you know the, the 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 restrictions you know you are told the government tells you 55 miles per hour you go 56 you get a ticket you go 90 you may be your car may be impounded well in Canada they may impound your car on the spot mm -hmm. so the Bible tells us you obey, these are the blessings. You disobey, this is the consequence. Now Jesus came to suffer the consequence for us. So we won't have to. But for those who reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, what he suffered is what that person can look forward to. But our subject is what is chasing you. Now let us go to Romans chapter 2. We read 6, 7, and 8. Our subject, what's chasing you? It is now 5 after 8. I'll release you a little after 8.30. Romans 2, reading from verse 8. And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 8. Sorry, not 8. 6 to 8. Thank you for being alert. Who shall render to every man according to his deeds. Yes, that's the judgment. To them that by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. What will they get? Eternal life. You see, notice again. To them who through by patient 
continuance in well-doing. Seek for, they desire it, glory and honor and immortality. What will God give them? Eternal life. But unto them who what? Are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. Come on. Indignation and wrath. And so we have two sides. Those who do what's right in the sight of God, they can expect at the end of verse 7, eternal life. Those who disobey God, what can they expect at the end of verse 8? Indignation and wrath. The Bible says, the wrath of God cometh upon the disobedient. Not only the wrath of God, the wrath of parents. Am I telling the truth? The wrath of the police. The wrath of the army. You're not where you're supposed to be, you're the army. The wrath of the authorities comes upon you. The wrath always comes upon the disobedient. Even if you are a member of a gang, are you with me? And you violate the rules of that gang, the wrath of that gang will come upon you. There are grown men who play professional football. When there's a team meeting, if you're late, you're fined. You're fined thousands of dollars. Disobedience brings wrath. Obedience brings blessings. What's our subject? What's chasing you? Now, go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28. We'll read from verse 1. Deuteronomy book number 5, written by Moses. Well, most of it, the chapter about his death could not have been written by Moses. <clears throat> not as far as human beings think. You have Deuteronomy 28. We read from verse 1. Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, please speak simply through me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is probably the simplest message I have delivered so far. But simple is good. You know, Eloi says, when your simplicity goes, your power is gone. Verse 1, Deuteronomy 28. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God shall set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Now read verse 2. Uh, verse, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Now stop. <laughs> Look at the word overtake. When Jacob left Laban, the Bible says Laban overtook him. Because Laban chased him and overtook him. The same Hebrew word used there in Deuteronomy 22 is used, speaking of Laban overtaking now. When you're on the highway, and you're all on the highway tonight, when someone overtook you, what happened? The, yes, the person had to catch up with you first to pass you. The Bible says, if you obey God, God's blessings will come flying and they'll catch up with you. They'll overtake you. You cannot outrun God's blessings. Somebody say amen. Now the other side of the coin. Come on, tell me. You cannot outrun God's curses. The choice is yours. And so the Bible says, and all these blessings shall come on thee. Deuteronomy 28, 2 and shall overtake thee if thou shalt hearken under the voice of the Lord that now read verse 3 what does that say blessed shall thou be in the city come on and blessed shall thou be in the field blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep blessing 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 blessed shall be the basket and thy store Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. Now read verse six, verse 7 carefully. What does that say? The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Go to verse 8. The Lord shall command the blessings upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto stop. Look at verse 8. Hmm? The Lord shall do what? Command the blessing. Go chase that man. You may say, how does God command the blessing? Let me ask you this. Did God command the ravens to feed Elijah? Yes or no? Did God command the sea to stop on that lake? 
Did God command the wind to keep quiet? The Bible says, if I command the locusts to devour the land. And I will command the blessings upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand unto. We read that and we pass it over as though it's symbolic. My brothers and sisters, if there's one thing I say when I preach and I'll say it until I die, obey God. I'll drop dead saying, obey God. And God is good. Mm -hmm. As I told you a couple nights ago, if Adam had obeyed, come on, we would not be in this condition today. No sickness, no rebellion, no crime, no bombs in Gaza or wherever they're bombing, no police, no soldiers, no doctors, no nurses. God bless them now, but none of that. No institutions for unruly boys and girls. Mm -mm. No prisoners of war, no holocaust, no slavery, no genocide in Rwanda. None of that if Adam had only obeyed. I, we just don't understand the blessings of obedience. Let's go back. Well, let's leave Deuteronomy for a while. Let us go to First Peter chapter four. We're looking at obedience. Another word for obedience is life. Another word for disobedience, death. Mm -hmm. First Peter chapter four. We read verse seventeen. I know you know it very well. Do you have that? But the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God now? What do we learn about the gospel in that word, that verse? It must be obeyed. The gospel must be obeyed. Which means the gospel contains the Ten Commandments. Because the only thing God wants you to obey is his law. Which is the whole duty, come on, of man. Let's reason together. The gospel must be obeyed. But let's get another witness. Let's go to Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Our subject, what's chasing you? Second Thessalonians chapter 1. We read 7 and 8 of 2 Thessalonians, 7 and 8, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Do you have that? And to you who troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus had been revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, finished the verse, and on them that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. Here again we have the gospel must be obeyed. Mm -hmm. Now, let us go to Romans 1. We read verse 16. Romans 1 verse 16. You know this verse very well. Do you have it? Read with me. What does it say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Come on, to everyone. Aha. Uh -huh. Belief, obedience is belief in action. Obedience is belief in action. There is no salvation outside of obedience. And I'm not talking about legalism. Legalism is an attempt a person makes to save his life or her life. No, no, no. Only Christ can do that. Obedience is not legalism. Obedience is love. Obedience is life. Romans 1, 16 again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, to everyone that believeth. My brothers and sisters, God has blessings for those who obey. And sad to say, he has painful consequences for those who disobey. 
the choice is yours but i want you to understand tonight that the gospel must be obeyed where there's no obedience there really is no faith you know paul talks about faith in galatians and romans faith 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 james talks about works they are not one against the other paul is talking about what happens the instant you give your life to christ like the publican in the temple if god be merciful to me a sinner christ said he was justified james is talking about now what kind of life should you live but for him to be justified he had to do what admit that trust he had to do something that thing is obedience the bible tells us god's commandment is that we believe on the lord jesus christ that we believe is a command to believe we can obey or disobey let me say it again salvation has a condition what's that obedience do you not see that in genesis 2 16 17 one of my favorite passages and the lord god commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die in other words in the day you disobey you will die turn that coin around if you obey come on you will live salvation has a condition but let's identify our problem as a species called human being. Go to Romans 8. Let's look at our problem. It is so big, only divine power can conquer that problem. No psychiatrist can help you with that. No doctor, no therapist, no counselor, no behavioral specialist. Mm -mm. Only God can help you with the problem we're about to encounter. Romans 8, reading verse 7 and verse 8. Are you there? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. What that verse is telling us, we are born with a condition that we cannot change. If you tell, you put a sign, let's say you've got a store downtown, you sell something. You put a sign on your window, do not throw a brick through this window. You come to that store tomorrow, you'll find a brick was thrown through that window. There is something in us. When we see do not, we decide we will do. Mm -hmm. That's the way we're born. When we see do not, we do. When we see do, we do not. That condition can only be changed by God. If God had not come down to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve would have been lost forever because they could not come to him. Let's go to Genesis 3. Let's read from verse 7. Well, 6. Let's read from 6. It's now 20 after 8. Our subject, what's chasing you? Genesis 3, reading from verse 7. When you found it, say amen. Remember to pray and ask God to put his words in my mouth. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Pause. Adam and Eve heard. In this building and online, there are people who are hearing what I'm saying. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day what was their response and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden to hide from God is to hide from life and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him where art thou and he said I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself why did I take you to this passage? The natural behavior of a sinner is to avoid God. Now, go to Romans chapter 3. Let's read from verse 10. Our subject, what's chasing you? Romans 3, 
Reading from verse 10, remember I just said the natural response of a sinner is to avoid God. Unless God does something in that person's heart and mind. You have Romans 3, verse 10. Read with me, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now very carefully, verse 11. There is none that understandeth, come on, there is none that seeketh after God. Stop. It is God who seeks you. Some things have to be said over and over and over to get through the skull. Let me say it again. You of your own self, I of my own self can never seek God. Not I will never. I cannot seek God. God has to seek me. And he does that through his spirit. Now. I have to decide how I'll respond to God's seeking of me. I can say, leave me alone, or I can say, thank you for seeking me. Here I am. Save me. No human. Now, we can seek church. Because church is a social organization. So we seek it. We have friends. They dress the way we dress, they eat the way we eat, they talk the way we talk, we fellowship, we understand each other, we seek church. But few people seek God. To seek God is to seek, you see, <laughs> when you preach and it goes all over the world, you have to be careful of the stories you tell. <laughs> ah. Well, maybe I won't tell you this. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Sometimes I get emails from young ladies. I like this man. I like this man. I want him. Is this God's will for you? Well, I'm getting up in age. I'm 22. <laughs> My biological clock is ticking. I need this. I need that. And what I need, the man has. They are seeking. Are you with me? Going after, seeking a man. When Christ fed the 5,000, they chased him across the lake. He crossed the lake. They got into the boat and chased him. He said, you know why you're chasing me? You're chasing fish and bread. Aki and saltfish. You see, that's what they were chasing. You're not chasing me because you saw the miracle. Are you following me? People chase they go to church for fellowship. They go to church for friendship. They go to church because it's a nice thing to do. And church-going people are respected in the community. They go to church because they like the preacher. They go to church, depending on what church you go, because it gives you two hours to shout and scream and let out all your frustrations before you go back to work and get some more frustration. Then you come back the next weekend, let it out again. So it's a catharsis. Listen to me. Few people seek God. Because to seek God is to seek holiness. To seek God is to seek righteousness. To seek God is to seek integrity in your business dealings. Nobody seeks God. But we seek church. My brothers and sisters... The Bible says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It did not say against church. It, why is it enmity against God? The verse tells you it is not subject to the law of God. In other words, it does not obey. Obeying God is absolutely foreign to the carnal nature. Unless God puts an a desire in that person and so Jesus says no man can come to me except they were given to him of my father when God puts that impulse in you it is an impulse that shows you your condition and an impulse to obey your Savior whatever he says I'll do that is the condition of blessing and the greatest blessing is a place with Christ when he comes union with him now and a place with him when he comes 
Now someone may say, yes, preacher, but I know an atheist who's blessed. Surely atheists are blessed. A lot of drug addicts who are, or drug dealers who have big cars and big houses, they make millions of dollars. The blessings of God continue into the life to come. The blessings of Satan, they end with you in the flames of hell. The devil promised Christ, all these kingdoms will I give thee. And the glory of them, if thou wilt fall down and worship me, Satan can give you things. But doesn't the farmer fatten the cow before he kills it? That's all the devil does. He fattens you for the kill. He gives you things. But what God gives are designed to prepare you for eternal life. And so the Bible says, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of the life to come. The Bible says, doing what's right has benefits into the new world. When we talk of God's blessings, we are not talking about an earthly blessing and it stops with the earth. It, can, it survives this earth and extends into the life to come. And so my question to you is, what is chasing you? Listen again to Deuteronomy 28 verse 2. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God shall set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shall thou be in the city. Blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and shall flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessings upon thee and thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand to. And he shall bless in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. My brothers and sisters, you continue all the way down to 13 to see the blessings of God. The condition is one condition. Give me that word obedience in how many languages can I appeal to you in this building and online obey God do exactly what God tells you and all God wants from you or me is to obey his ten commandments we read last night Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's the point of all of this? If you live as long as Methuselah, what's the point? Fear God, come on, and keep his commandments. Finish the verse. For this is the whole duty of man. Man means Korean, Japanese, American, Jamaican, Brazilian, you name it. By the way, it's also the whole duty of angels. Listen to Psalm 103 verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Word, commandment in that verse, same thing. Listen to the verse. That do his commandments. The next statement says, hearkening unto the voice of his word. It is a poetic structure. They say the same thing. Because ultimately, the word of God is the commandment of God. What does the Bible say about God's commandments? They are truth. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. And we're called upon to obey the truth of the gospel. All we have asked you, obey, obey, obey. That's what the Spirit keeps telling me, obey. You see, a willingness to obey is all God need you give him that and see what he does with your life just the willingness the readiness as if when God called Isaiah what did he say here am I what send me he was willing not knowing the scope of the mission 
And all God is asking you tonight, will you, are you willing to obey me? Can you trust me to guide your life? The reality is, if God doesn't guide you, the devil does. We see this all the way in the Garden of Eden. God said, thou shalt surely die. Satan said, you shall not surely die. Case closed. And they chose, you shall not surely die. And we're suffering. Intelligence of the highest kind is that intelligence that leads to obedience to God. And so tonight, I ask you, what's chasing you? Why is everything going wrong? Why is it nothing works out? The Bible says the curse causeless, come on, shall not come. In other words, the Bible says there's a reason why you're suffering. There's a reason why that business of yours isn't prospering. There is a reason. And that reason can be traced all the way back to obedience or disobedience. Now you may say, but these are the last days we're expecting persecution. Yes. But it does not change the principle, obedience brings blessings. And so I say again to you before I close, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. And I ask you, what's chasing you? Either the blessings of God or the curses of God. You cannot escape from either one. They catch up with you. You know, the Jews have been blessed, even though they're no longer God's favored people. They can still come to him individually. And the blessings God placed on them thousands of years ago is still with them. It's not by accident they control the banking system, so people say, around the world. It is not by accident. There's a blessing that has pursued them. Now, they also said, his blood be upon us. We know what has happened to them for thousands of years of persecution. Both have pursued them. We've seen it both. Blessing and cursing. For you and for me tonight, we can say, God, I want to be chased by blessing. And the greatest blessing is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Christ says to you and to me tonight, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide. In his love question for you what is it you're doing you know you should stop don't tell me choose right now to stop and put an end to curses choose right now to stop God cannot decide for you but he can bless your decision let me say it again choose right now whatever it is stop in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of his shed blood. Because remember the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And sin is such a terrible thing. Only divine power can conquer sin. Angelic power cannot conquer sin. Gabriel can't conquer sin for you. Only the power of Christ. That is why someone equal with God had to come. That's how terrible sin is. But if you will decide, Father help me. I want to do what's pleasing in your sight. There's something I'm doing that's wrong. And I have known it for decades. I want to stop. You pray that prayer. And God will help you even before you finish that short little prayer. Because before you speak, the Bible says God will answer. Because he sees the desire of the heart before he hears the utterance of the mouth. Head bowed, eyes closed. May God in heaven... How can your word be any clearer? The problem, Father, is not that the commandments are difficult or your word isn't clear. The problem is the condition of the human heart. Jesus could not make it clear. That's why he uttered words of frustration in John 8, 43. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. If Christ had problems, Father, what about me? But Father, I believe under the sound of my voice which I hope is your voice, are those who are deciding right now, there's something in my life I need to stop. Because, Father, if you have to stop them, it will be catastrophic. So it's better to fall on the rock, dear God, than to have the rock 
fall on us. And why heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If anyone will say, Father, there's, I need power to get, to get over this or that, to stop this practice or that practice. If that's your prayer, your genuine desire, come to the altar, let us pray together. There's, I need power, Father, to stop this or stop that. If that's your prayer, come and join me right here. Let's kneel and let's pray for that power. Leave your seat and come. I'll wait for you. If that's your prayer, Father, there's something I need to get over. And I need that help. Leave your seat and come. Let us pray. Don't wait until next tomorrow night service. You may not see tomorrow night. Today is the appointed time. Come and say, Father, I need that strength. Give it to me, God. Give it to me. Come and join us right at the altar. Come. As the Spirit speaks to you, don't resist Him. Come. If you're physically able, kneel. Father in heaven, life is uncertain, even for the genuine Christian. Because good people die, and you never send a warning. Our only intelligent choice, dear God, is to say, if I am alive today, let me do what is right today, because God does not send advance warning even to his people. Father, we've come before you tonight. We want you to make us tired of sin. We want to be sick to death of disobedience, dear God. Because we've seen, if we will be honest with ourselves, disobedience has no eternal benefit, dear God. The only thing eternal about disobedience is eternal destruction. Now, God, we bow before you with nothing in ourselves to commend to you. And it's that very helplessness, Father, that attracts you to us. Come, God, put into us a hatred for sin. Let it be a nasty taste in our mouths, dear God, because what we hate, we avoid. We want to avoid sin, God. Please sensitize us to the horror of sin and the joys of obedience. Your sons, your daughters have come to say, there's something I need to stop. Whether in this building or online, that's why they came. In the name of Jesus Christ. Give them that power beginning right now, God. Because the power to overcome cannot be delayed. Right now, through your spirit, unleash that power in their lives. Because I believe, dear God, their desire is genuine. Father, I am praying to a God who says of himself, He is not willing that any should perish. Dear God, if you mean those words, and we believe you do, do something right now. Let us leave, determined to leave that thing aside that we've been doing in violation of your word. Now, Father, as it is said of Christ in the Old Testament, let it be said of us, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Right now, Father, with the finger of God, which is the Holy Ghost, write your law again in our hearts, or put it for the first time, that we may produce from the heart which is, as Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. Father, bless us with your presence. Let your angels take us safely home. Let us enter our houses, different persons tonight, I pray. Bring us back tomorrow night, Father, with a renewed zeal to obey you. In Jesus' name, I pray, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Let's sing verse 1 again. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art will you take from the message raise your hand yes my dear sister no one can outrun God's blessings or his curses 
you choose the one you want to chase you somebody else what will you take from the message tonight tell us raise that hand and yes my brother I choose Christ ah God bless you I choose Christ he said yes sister to be obedient and how many things everything that God tells us yes somebody else yes my dear sister obedience is belief with shoes on it are you following me faith with shoes is obedience mm -hmm. my sister why well, never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ it is the power of God no one is ashamed of power somebody else what will you take from the message yes my pastor I want God's blessings to overtake me yes so I'm gonna slow down in obedience let them catch up with me don't try to outrun God in rebellion. Slow down. Let the blessings ah, catch you. What a beautiful picture. These blessings shall overtake you. Ah, anybody else? Yes. Obedience brings blessings that extend from this life into the life to come. Yes, my dear sister. Many are converted to Christianity or to the church but not to Christ, not to God. Because conversion to God is conversion to holiness, righteousness, integrity, honesty. Yes, that's God. It is conversion to love for your enemy. Mm -hmm. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Let all God's people say, Amen and amen. Come tomorrow, bring someone with you. Remember the questions we want so we can enlighten you by trying to explain them. Put your prayer requests so we can pray for you. And may God watch over you tonight with joy and bring you back tomorrow. God is good and all the time. Good night, my friends in the building and online.